the session today. So we're just recording the uh, audio. My name is Sophie. I'll be your moderator today from Asian Studies. And then we have Connie on the chat moderating our questions for us. So we might just give it one or two more minutes for anyone else to come in. Thank you again to everybody that's joining us for today so far. And we've got a really interesting session planned for you for today. So um, once again, if you have any questions for us, anything you'd like to contribute, feel free to add it in the chat section, bottom right. And otherwise, sit tight. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, we'll go ahead and then anyone else can uh, join us as well. So officially, welcome everybody today to our webinar, Korean Language Talk, Best Practice for Learning Korean. And before we begin, we would just like to acknowledge that UBC Vancouver is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Salao Watooth people. So we'd like to welcome everybody here again today and we hope the presentation will help answer some of your questions about learning Korean at UBC and also where it can take you after that. Just before I introduce our two panellists, we'd like to note a couple of housekeeping items. Um, today's webinar will be in three parts. We will first have our panellist introduction, then we'll follow that with some Q&A based on questions that people submitted for us. Thank you very much for that. And, um, and then at the end, we'll have time to ask some additional questions via the chat box and we'll do our best to address as many as we can. So please note today's webinar is being recorded and a full version of the PowerPoint slides will be shared at the um, next week once we're done and we'll make sure that everybody gets access to the recording as well. So we have your email addresses for that. That will all be easy for us to do. So. We'll go ahead now and introduce our first panellist, Yuri Shin. So Yuri is our lecturer in Korean language at the Department of Asian Studies. Yuri, I'll let you say a quick hello to everybody. 안녕하세요. 네, I'm, uh, I'm teaching Korean uh, this year. I will teach the first year and third year Korean. And um, I'm in charge of placement interview. And I'm the contact person if you have any questions about Korean language program in general or any uh, placement interview. 감사합니다. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Yuri. And then our second panelist for today is Sophie Rock. 
Now, Sophie is a fourth year UBC student and international relations major. She is also just freshly returned from an exchanging career, which is very exciting. She's joining us from Seattle now. Sophie, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, like Sophie was saying, my name is Sophie and I'm a yes. fourth year international <laughs> relations major here at UBC and I'm also an Asian language and culture minor uh, studying Korean. So I've taken a whole host of Korean language courses at UBC and also some Korean related Asia courses um, also at UBC. And uh, as Sophie just said, I'm about two weeks back from my year long exchange at Yonsei University in Seoul. So it's been a little bit of time to be back here. Um, I'm excited to share with you today. Also, I just want to acknowledge that I'm not um, at UBC currently. So I'm sitting per currently on Puyallup tribal land. Um, and so I want to honor the traditional landowners of the land that I'm on now. I'd encourage you, if you're taking this from any place that's not point gray to just look into the traditional landowners of the indigenous people who owned your land before and see how you can honor them in today's in today's space. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Yuri and Sophie. So we will go on to find out a little bit more about the amazing language that is Korean. So part one of our session today is why learn Korean? So we'll go ahead. The first question is, well, that's just it. Why should you learn Korean? So, Yuri, would you like to start us off? Okay, so I want to start with why learning foreign language in general is good. So learning foreign languages makes you understand their culture and people better. I can share my personal experience as a foreign language learner briefly. So I learned German, Mandarin, Japanese, Latin, Korean sign language and Turkish during college. So how many languages can I speak now? Well, one and a half. Korean is a name of my native language and English is a second language. What about others? Not much. Maybe just a little bit of Japanese, but I can't really even remember very basic basis of other languages I've learned. So you might be asking then, why am I saying learning foreign language is good? Because learning foreign language is more than just becoming fluent in that language. So you learn their culture and you get to understand the people better, which will stay with you for life many years after stop learning, although you forget all the grammar and vocabulary. And so you get more interested in culture and the country and you want to experience, experience and learn more, which will enrich your life. So although I don't even remember how to say hi in Turkish, the little taste of Turkish culture that my teacher said during class, such as their love for tea, passionate Turkish people, how they can spend the whole day just chatting about everything in the tea house, those are still clear in my memory. And I always want to go to Turkey in one day. So learning foreign languages also makes you connect with the speakers and learners of languages more easily. You instant, instantly feel closer to them and it's easier to build relationships. So I strongly recommend you learning foreign languages while you're at university, especially if it's less commonly taught language like Korean in North America. So why should you learn Korean then? Again, you get to understand their culture and people better. So more than 7 million pe Korean people living abroad, and there are more than um, 200,000 Korean people living in Canada. So wherever you go or live, you will have a chance to meet and interact with them. And learning Korean will make your world bigger. And you can also learn about topics you're interested in. So you don't need to wait for the subtitles of your favorite shows anymore. You can watch them live. You can post your comments in Korean and communicate with your favorite celebrities directly on Instagram. And you, gain, you can gain more career opportunities by learning Korean. Being multilingual and multicultural will increase your chances of getting hired and open the door to more opportunities. And also, if you consider teaching English in um, foreign countries, not as your long term career, but just to get more experience during your college, Korea is a very good choice. It's a very safe country to live in, and a lot of short term and long term jobs available. And they also have a government sponsored mm -hmm. program called Talk. And if you're interested, I can talk more about that during the question and um, answer session. And now Sophie will tell you more why you should learn Korean. Yep. Awesome. So, Go ahead, Sophie uh, Rock. 
Awesome, thank you. So first of all, um, I always told myself while I was learning the language, no matter how hard or difficult it became, uh, you're never going to regret learning to speak uh, a second language or just another language in general. Like Dr. Shin was saying, there's a whole host of languages that you can learn. And even if you don't keep up with them, it's always a good idea to, to keep learning and to keep growing. And so you know, when you're really struggling with your language learning, I don't think there's ever going to be a point in your time uh, where you're going to regret having taken on that task to learn a language. You know, sometimes it's it's a hard exam or a word you just can't remember or a really embarrassing interaction where you just said something so totally incorrect. But you know, in 35 years or 40 years, when we sit back and think, man, I wish I never spent all that time learning Korean. I don't think you'll ever think that. Um, of course, aside from that, you know, it's going to make you more competitive in many fields, not just in terms of the job market, but also in terms of grad school, volunteer positions. Um, you know, this is a great skill. Learning a language is such a hard task and it grows your brain in so many ways. Uh, so it's not just a sign of, oh, this person is fluent in another language that's beneficial to our company or school, but it's that this person has decided to take on a really difficult task and also has a passion to communicate with others. Our world is becoming ever more globalized um, and we can't just rely on English as being this global language. Uh, There's so many beautiful languages to learn and so you should definitely take one, pick with it and, and, and keep up with it. Um, last but not least, it really does open your world up to a whole host of new opportunities and new communities. Uh, people you may not have been able to communicate with before, suddenly you're able to even just have a little bit of communication. Um, I think communication and language is a sign of compassion, wanting to understand what a person has to say. And spending that time to learn someone's language is just a sign that you're willing to connect with them. So I think uh, aside from, from just the basic obvious things about learning a language and being able to work in that country or do these things, you're also able to connect with just so many people, which is a, a really beautiful, awesome opportunity. Wonderful. And everyone may be wondering, so how do I learn that Korean language? Well, the good news is we've got so many options for you on offer. And that's actually our next question, which is a little bit more about UBC's own Korean language programs and courses and what you might have to choose from. So Yuri is going to start us off again with some information. Yuri, I'll let you take over. Okay, so UBC is one of the few Canadian universities that offers four levels of Korean from beginner to fourth year Korean. And assuming a lot of you are absolute beginners or beginners, I'll be going to talk about one or two and then you can ask me about other courses during the question and answer session. So our Korean 102 is for absolute beginners course and it's six credit course over two terms. So you have to stay for both terms. And we also offer intensive course in term two. So instead of one hour per day, you're having two hours of course a day. And also you, we offer summer intensive course. So six week course that cover um, two terms, the big six credits of uh, Korean 102. So if you are not an absolute beginner, so you just watched Running Man so many years and now you understand, you know, maybe 20, 30% of it without subtitles. So then, or you taught yourself some Korean alphabets on your own, then intensive course is a great uh, choice for you to go. But if you're really absolute beginner, all you know is 안녕하세요, 감사합니다, 오빠, 사랑해, then 102 for two terms is a great choice. And also, um, if you so if you are if you already learn Korean a little bit, whether in formal classroom or just casually on your own, if you feel that maybe you can be qualified for more the higher course, then please come to the place in review. And after the interview, even if you don't have any experience learning Korean in formal classroom, you can be placed into 200 or 300, even 400. Wonderful. And have I swapped it over at the correct time? Yuri, jump to the next slide. So this, so we also offer four different courses in fourth year Korean. I'm not sure how many of you are actually speak Korean relatively fluently. So I will just uh, leave this for question and session in case anyone is interested. Wonderful. So we have several different options on offer, which is great. And of course, once you have started learning Korean, you might be wondering then what are some particularly good tips about learning the language and making it, you know, getting 
familiar with it, getting it to stay in your head. So we thought the next section, we'd delve into that a little bit more in terms of practicing and learning your Korean. So we're wondering, Yuri, if you could tell us what are some good tips on learning Korean? So uh, next slide, please. So of course, you can take our courses here. So as I said, you don't have to start from 102 if you learn a little bit on your own. So after the placement, you can take different courses. But if you have time, if it fits your schedule, then taking Korean courses will be the easiest and fastest way to master the language. And the next slide, please. And also you can, oh, so I'm doing, I'm currently developing this Korean language tutoring center, and that's going to be on campus course, and it's going to be a self-enrolled course. So if you're interested in learning Korean or practicing, actually practicing Korean, you can just enroll for this website on your own and then sign up and you can connect with another peer who is learning or who can speak the language. So this word tutoring is a little bit misleading. It's not going to be the structure of tutor uh, teaching sessions. It's more of you can sign up for 15 or 30 minutes and um, to meet with another peer who is learning Korean or who took first or second year Korean before and who can speak. So if you learn Korean on your own, if you and you know some grammar, but if you want to practice what you learn or if you have any specific questions about how you can use it in your speech, then this will be a great option and more options will be given on this website and that's going to be announced in the late August or early September. So please look forward to it. And next slide, please. And also, of course, you can uh, check out YouTube. There are many videos that are available for you to learn Korean on your own. And I'm going to introduce these two websites, um, two um, videos. So one is created by Goryeo Taekyo, the Korea University, one of, one of the top universities in Korea. And they have the Language Institute. So then they created these videos. So these are taught by the um, trained Korean teachers and you don't need any textbook or anything. Each video is one lesson. You can learn some vocabulary, grammar, you will watch a dialogue and some other practice as well. And another uh, video is a good reference for the grammar will be Professor Yoon's Korean language class. So this is created by Professor Yoon who is in University of Iowa, a Korean um, professor, and he created lots of videos mostly covering the grammars for um, elementary and intermediate Korean. So if you're studying Korean on your own and if you have any questions about some grammar patterns, you can go quickly check and you'll find very useful videos here. So both are both videos are either um, has English subtitles or uh, they speak English, so you don't need to uh, worry about not understanding their explanation. And next slide, please. Or you can consider joining student clubs. So one club is called Unique, and they are the ones who are promoting Korean culture and um, languages to on our own UBC campus. And previous years, they've been having this um, Korean language table. So they what they do is they really have a placement test and depending on your level you meet other five or six other students who are on the same level and they have one volunteer teacher they meet per week once uh, weekly and they really give a lesson on korean grammar and um speech so if i don't know whether they're still doing the same thing this year because of the pandemic but it's a good uh, place to check and another student club K-Wave, they do less language thing, but they're more uh, into Korean entertainment and also K-pop dance. So if you are interested in K-pop dance, then K-Wave is a good um, place to go. And I always have a few students who are um, K-Wave members. So there are people who are learning Korean there, um, actively now. So it'll be great to connect with your peers who share the same interest. Next slide, please. Okay. And then another one that you can do is UBC Tandem Language Learning Program. So what they do is at the BU Beach terms, they have they open their registration. So once you register and then enter the language you're interested in, then they match you with someone for language exchange. Actually, Sophie um, joined this program before, so she can share her experience. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Shin. Uh, yeah, so I did the Korean 
uh, made, made some Korean friends through the tandem language learning program at UBC in my second year of university. And it's a really great opportunity to meet other Korean language speakers on campus. Um, you don't necessarily have to have English as your first language either. You simply say what language you're willing to teach and what language you would like to learn. So if you are more comfortable in Mandarin or Spanish, there's so many opportunities for you to uh, teach this student, uh, like a Korean speaking student, your language while they teach you Korean. Uh, you meet once a week for an hour and a half. 45 minutes is spent in the language you would like to teach and 45 minutes is spent in the language you would like to learn. It's pretty open-ended, so sometimes I would meet with my partner and we would just talk about life or exams or moving to Korea, and sometimes we would meet up and talk about very specific things that the tandem program recommended we speak, or that we'd speak about. Um, so it's a great program. They're currently figuring out how it's going to look for the fall. Likely it'll open back up in person in second semester of the winter session. Um, but I have a feeling they might find some sort of online way to do this, which brings me to my next slide, um, which is about Korean language learning apps. Um, so first and foremost, I'm sure as a university student, you are very well aware of Quizlet. Um, this is a really great opportunity to do things like vocabulary review. Um, I really disciplined myself to spend time on the bus or right before class, or if I was waiting for an appointment, to just always be on my Quizlet app uh, reviewing vocabulary. Um, the, the students I admired the most, who had the most handle over the language, always had a very plentiful vocabulary. They knew the word for everything, and I was always so impressed by that. Uh, so finding something like Quizlet or another vocabulary practicing app is a great way to keep you on your toes, to just be learning always. Um, but aside from that, kind of similar to the Tandem program, uh, recently these language exchange apps like italki or HelloTalk have become increasingly popular. They're a kind of platform where you can log in and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who speak the same language as you or who speak a language you'd like to learn. There's also a forum space where you can maybe post a recording of your voice so someone can check your pronunciation, or you can take a picture of your homework assignment and somebody can tell you what mistakes you've made, or you can post a writing and someone can grade that as well. So it's a really great opportunity to meet people. Um, but aside from just meeting people, it gets you talking in Korean every single day, which I think is really important. Um, you can, of course, speak to people through the recordings, but also through texting. And I found that this was also a really great way to stay up to date on kind of modern language. Language changes really, really fast. And of course, the language and grammar that you're learning in your language courses is incredibly important and foundational. But every time you, you log onto the internet, there's some new abbreviation or some new way of spelling some word. Um, and these are great opportunities to kind of stay up to date with that spoken language and the fast paced way that languages change. Uh, so it gives you a really good opportunity to not only meet people uh, across the globe, especially in this time of pandemic and COVID, um, it's very active right now, a uh, good way to practice and, and also just stay up to date on new language trends, which is just constantly changing. Um, another thing I would recommend if you're looking to take your Korean kind of from intermediate to advanced and maybe the professional category is to improve your writing skills. UBC's Korean 301 and 302 focuses a lot on writing. Uh, and then the Yonsei uh, levels of three and four that I took at their intensive levels at, at Yonsei University focused a lot on writing as well. And I was really surprised at how uh, my peers faced this. Writing is difficult for sure. I'm no, I'm no professional here. I make lots of mistakes when I write. But thanks to my time at UBC, I got really confident in just sitting down and writing something, whether or not there were lots of mistakes. And this was something my peers at Yonsei seemed to not have as great of a skill in. They weren't so confident in their writing skills. Uh, and especially if you're looking to take advanced Korean, work into that professional sphere, or even take something like the topic test, writing is a really important uh, task to just have confidence in. If you're looking to take the topic exam, one third of the exam is only four writing questions. And it is a very hard portion for many, many students. Uh, most students who do really well on listening uh, and reading struggle a lot on the writing section. 
And I find that just keeping up, whether it's through those language exchange apps with daily texting or even keeping like a daily journal in Korean, just to keep that uh, writing skill flowing is really important. Uh, ideally, if you have someone who could grade your Korean writing so that you're not making a ton of mistakes so that you can learn from mistakes that you're making, it would be ideal. But even if not, just getting in the practice of, of getting that confidence of being able to just sit down and write a small essay in Korean or write a letter in Korean, you know, something that's more than just two or three sentences or just fill in the blank, like lots of homework assignments, uh, I think is something that will bring you really, really far and improve your, your Korean language skill quite a bit, especially if you're looking to take it kind of out of the classroom setting. That's wonderful. So thank you, Yuri and Sophie, for all of those tips. Um, and I guess we would all love to hear a little bit more about Sophie's experience in Korea, which leads us to our next question. So obviously Sophie was lucky to get to travel to Yonsei University in August last year together with Go Global and experience a really interesting time over there, particularly probably in the last couple of months. So I guess I will hand over to her to tell us why should you go on an exchange to Korea? Yeah, thank you, Sophie. It was such an awesome opportunity. I cannot stress enough how amazing of an opportunity it was and how lucky I was to be able to go. Um, I would recommend any of you, even if you're just beginning to learn Korean now, uh, to, to plan a time to go to Korea and use that language. Um, you've been learning, you've been working so hard, you're going to struggle, you're going to reach barriers, and you're going to get frustrated. But being in Korea and being able to use what you've learned is just such an amazing opportunity. Um, the one thing I loved the most about being in Korea was leaving my intensive Korean language class and being able to just go outside and immediately begin to use what I had been learning. Um, you know, at UBC, you might be limited in your ability to practice outside of the classroom. But in Korea, that limit does not exist. You're able to really communicate with anyone around you. Try the new vocabulary word you learned. That's complicated grammar. Go form a sentence and go try it out with even just somebody at the sales clerk desk. Um, it's a really great opportunity to just put to practice what you've used. And also, even if you haven't learned the language, but you're learning uh, about culture um, and history, this is a really awesome opportunity to experience that firsthand. Naturally, when you're abroad, your language skill is going to increase, though the level of your language uh, advancement is definitely going to depend on your level of commitment. It is really easy to go to Korea and speak a lot of English or your uh, mostly just English, but your native tongue as well. Um, and of course, even if you're just speaking English when you're when you're overseas, um, your your Korean will naturally increase a little bit because you're always surrounded by it. But if you make a really concentrated effort to speak Korean and to use the language, you're going to find that your language skill is really going to increase a ton. Not just speaking, but also listening. Uh, my understanding increased quite a bit because you're always listening to Korean, reading as well. You're always seeing the news and writing too if you make a good effort. Yeah, next slide, please. So a couple of tips if you're looking to go on exchange. I have a few of them. Of course, there's a, there's a plethora of tips to be given, but these are the ones that I would say are probably the most important. If you have the time, I would certainly recommend going for the full year. If you're maybe a first or second year now, start to plan your academic calendar around go, being on exchange for a full year. It's an amazing opportunity uh, that I would recommend over just a one term or summer exchange. Of course, it's not always possible, but somebody told me before I went to Korea that the first four months are just about getting used to living in that country. And it's not really until after that period that you actually are able to use what you've learned. And I was a little skeptical about that, but it proved to be very, very true. The first four or five months for me in Seoul were just about getting acclimated to my surroundings. It was a new school. It was a new type of learning. I was in a whole new city environment, living in a country that I had never been to before. And so taking this opportunity to kind of just get used to everything and then having to immediately just come back to Vancouver or go back home would have been a little bit of a shame for me because the last four or five months was when I really began to grow significantly. That's when my language skill improved quite a bit. I got really used to Korean lifestyle and also figured out just, just basic things like where you want to get your groceries every week in your favorite restaurants. It also helps you build relationships with the friends that you've made in Korea. Um, and so I would say, if it is possible, really plan to do a full year. 
Of course, if it's not possible for you, one semester or a summer abroad or even just two weeks of travel, if you can if you can manage it, are going to be an amazing experience for you. And I would encourage you to go abroad no matter what. Um, but if you have the luxury of time, I would recommend a year. My second point here is to say yes to everything. Now, do this with a grain of salt and, and be safe, of course. But by saying yes to everything, you're going to put yourself in a lot of experiences that are kind of new and they're going to force you to grow and learn. Um, I said yes to a lot of things that I had never done before or eaten foods that I had never thought about trying before. Um, and by saying yes, even in situations where I wasn't 100% sure if I wanted to do this, I was able to have an amazing experience no matter what. Even the experiences that might not have been the most comfortable taught me a lot about the language or the culture, or I got to meet new people who became lifelong friends for me. Um, it can be scary, but that's the whole point of going on exchange. This brings me to my third point. You don't want to go overseas and just feel like you're at UBC Vancouver again. Um, that's the point of exchange is really to grow. Anytime you're feeling uncomfortable or it's, uh, frustrating, you're growing. And that's such a beautiful thing that you should honor. It's, it's, it's not always comfortable. It's not always fun. But if you go overseas and just kind of experience your regular lifestyle, why did you go overseas? Push yourself. Um, it's going to be a little uncomfortable at times, but the growing you will get out of those situations is amazing. Um, I also, you know, I'm sure you've heard of this before, but the foreigner bubble, it is a real, <laughs> it's real. <laughs> People told me before I came to Korea uh, to be really worried and cautious of the foreigner bubble. And by foreigner bubble, I mean being surrounded by people who speak this as you. A lot of exchange students tend to kind of stick together. It's easy because exchange students have the same kind of interests, whether that's going to special cafes or traveling around Korea or going to concerts or taking the same classes together. And it is really easy. And of course, you can make wonderful, amazing friendships within the exchange students on your exchange. That's not to say that you should avoid those people altogether. But it's really um, important to push yourself very hard to kind of get out of that foreigner bubble and to go meet, I would say, like domestic students around the campus that you're in or the Koreans in, in, in the neighborhood you live in. Um, it is hard. I knew coming into it that I wanted to not get stuck in that bubble. I gave myself a one month period of, okay, it's all right. And then after that month was up, I really pushed myself to kind of exit that foreigner bubble and start to expand my circle. It is, it is undoubtedly difficult. My tip for you in this situation is to speak Korean as much as possible, even if you don't have a strong foundation. Um, of course, so many people in Korea speak wonderful, amazing English, uh, but showing them that you've made a concentrated effort to learn their language can also make them feel a little more comfortable. I also found that a lot of my conversations maybe weren't entirely in English or entirely in Korean, but in moments in English where things felt uncomfortable or the understanding wasn't quite there, I could slip into Korean and quickly fix the situation. Or in situations in Korean where I started to kind of get in over my head, I could slip into English and also kind of kind of balance that and make sure that we were getting a basic understanding. Um, I also would recommend in order to get out of the foreigner bubble is to find a space you enjoy being in, whether that's a club or an activity, gardening, volunteering, going to the gym, something that you do with music, and find a space uh, at your university or in your neighborhood that does this kind of thing, and then stay there as often as possible. Um, this kind of consistency where people can see that you're here for a while and speaking Korean to them as well is going to help you meet people who have similar interests and who are going to be a natural fit for you. I also found that once I made one uh, really close Korean domestic friend, it, it just kind of snowballed into a friend of a friend. And, oh, I know this person. You should meet this person. And naturally, that circle will just kind of expand as you begin to meet people. Um, and that leads me to my last point, which is using what you've learned be open to making mistakes and just try to speak. You know, I found myself at one point in Korea trying to figure out how to register for a seat at the library. It was the most complicated process. I still don't think I've ever done it correctly once. But while I was trying to figure it out, I thought, well, I should just go ask the information desk. And I stopped and I thought, oh, this is, I don't know how to do that. What am I, like, what, like they, I don't speak enough Korean to, to speak to the information desk. But then I thought to myself, I'm living in Korea. I should be using this experience. I should be trying to use the language, use what I've learned, take a deep breath, step forward and just try. Um, and the person helped me and I was able to, to register for a seat maybe one time well. But it's also just really important to push yourself to use uh, the language that you're learning. You're going to undoubtedly make mistakes. Um, things won't sound 
sound perfect. You know, I've, I've made countless numbers of mistakes while I was abroad, certainly. Um, but you learn from those mistakes as well. And once you make one mistake and you, you're corrected, chances of you making that mistake again are quite low. So I would say, while you're on exchange, um, push yourself to meet people, push yourself to do new experiences, uh, push yourself to speak the language. It's, it's all going to pay off in the end, even in moments of uncomfortability. Um, it's always, always been worth it in my experience. And so to talk a little bit more about the UBC Go Global Exchange Program, we're not Go Global, so we don't have all of the information you might need. Uh, there are exchanges happening in term two of this academic year, 2020 winter. However, the application has already closed, so that's not long, no longer an option. Um, so if you're really interested in going to Korea as soon as possible, um, I would recommend a summer exchange or maybe fall and winter of next academic year. The applications open in September, and you can find all that information on the website, um, on the Go Global website. They're going to be posting it very soon, I'm sure. Um, of course, if you're looking to go to Korea, there are five university options. You have Korea University, Yuha Women's University, Yonsei, Seoul National, and Songgyukwan. Um, all of them are great. I have friends who have gone to all of these universities, and I haven't heard a negative experience from any of them. I would recommend if you're trying to decide which university is best for you, Look at their course options. Um, UBC Go Global lists the course options that are available at these universities and try to take a peek at which university might fit your kind of academic calendar or academic schedule the best. It's going to cause a lot uh, less stress in the long term about transfer credits. Currently, I'm trying to get my fourth year underway. And luckily, because Yonsei had so many great uh, courses from my international relations major and my advisors were able to help me work through it, I'm able to graduate this year uh, totally on time, despite having the complications or taking courses that might not translate 100% right back. So if you're interested on going on exchange, I would so encourage it. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sure there'll be some questions about it um, later. Yeah, thank you. That's wonderful. So thank you so much, Sophie, for all of that amazing information. So that brings us on to the last part of our session, which is Ask Away. And you don't need to be shy, feel free to add in any questions into the chat that you might like to know more about. We can also start off with a couple of other questions if we need. Now we can see there's one question from Marie about if UBC offers any financial aid to those who want to go on an exchange. It's an excellent question, Marie. Um, off the top of my head, I'm, I would imagine that there would be options available through student services. I'm assuming right. if you're a current UBC student. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, Sophie, can you speak any further to that one at all? Absolutely. So to go on exchange, there are, it depends if you're an international student or a domestic UBC student. Uh, there's a whole host of scholarships that you can qualify for, um, as well as Go Global has um, a $1,000 scholarship per student who who goes abroad, and that's uh, kind of essentially to cover travel costs. Um, so there are, there is financial aid, there are scholarships. That's a good question to ask Go Global specifically because it does look different depending on the type of student you are, which faculty you're in, how long you'll be abroad, what program you're doing. So I would recommend reaching out to Go Global to get a little bit more special information uh, on that. Wonderful. And then our next question comes from Jaslina. Jaslina would like to know from Sophie if you stayed on campus at Yonsei and how the general housing situation worked. Were you, did you have to find yeah. that yourself? Yep. That's a really great question. So I did do on-campus housing at Yonsei University. Um, most of my students or my friends who uh, went on exchange did stay in on-campus housing. It's quite affordable and if you're able to qualify for it and get access to it, it's very conveniently located and, and one of the more affordable options on housing. However, if you don't get housing and you're looking to live in Korea uh, while on exchange, maybe in a neighborhood next to your university, my best tip for you, and, and maybe Dr. Shin, you might have a different recommendation or people who, who might live in Korea, I don't know if there's anyone on the chat who has, but is to kind of show up and then get housing once you arrive. Uh, trying to find student housing or cheap affordable accommodation for international students prior to arrival is a little bit difficult and kind of a complicated process. And so my best suggestion for you would be to maybe find a cheap Airbnb or a cheap hotel that you can stay in for maybe a little 
mm, like about a week and then to walk around your neighborhood and look for maybe there's lots of posters posted everywhere for like Hasukjib or Kushiwan or these kind of like one rooms that you can rent um, and I think that being in person to find those uh, would be a much better selection than trying to do that online before you come to Korea. Amazing. Thank you, Sophie. So our next question comes from Bianco, uh, one for Yuri by the look of it. She's just said, unfortunately, my schedule can't fit any Korean 102 classes if she was to make it through the wait list. What might be a good tip to self learn the language and remain disciplined while balancing the course load with other classes? Yuri, can you advise? Yes, so um, I have actually uh, quite a few uh, students who are skipping 102 and then directly joining second year, third year Korean. Especially there are many students who are joining second year directly without skipping first year Korean. So a lot of them are just uh, learned Korean casually, so you don't really need to take classes or not or something like that to skip first year Korean. But if you are uh, determined enough and since you still have one month left before the course start, uh, the, term starts, I think you can, if you wanted to, you can touch, you can teach yourself Korean. So you can use those uh, resources that I gave you or Sophie mentioned, and then Hilton just mentioned that Talk To Me in Korean channel is great too. So you can use these channels um, to learn, to teach yourself some Korean. If you want to see our textbook, you can go to this website, and then this shows our textbook for Korean uh, 102. The whole thing is there except for exercise questions. So most of the grammar notes is there and also all the dialogues are there. And also on the same uh, website, you can find some uh, online exercises as well. So if you want it, you can actually teach yourself Korean well without taking the course from school. And you can just join the Korean course um, next 2021 winter starting from second year Korean. So I think it's totally doable. Did I that's, answer your question? That's cool. Well, thank you, Yuri. We'll we'll keep on keep going through our chat questions. Uh, the mm -hmm. next one comes from Serena. Serena would like to know from Yuri: Is it possible to hear a little bit more about the 400 level Korean classes? Oh, awesome. So, could you please uh, bring that slide showing the four? Oh yes. Classes? Yep. Just uh, bear with me just a moment. Right back at where we were. One too many. There we go. Okay, so we have three different courses in the fourth year uh, level. So the first one is 410 A and B. So you don't need to take these are not sequence classes. You can take each whichever one that fits your schedule, and each class is three um, credits and three hours per week. And what they do is you read Korean short stories, short fiction, and then you actually read it and learn the vocabulary and grammar, understand it. And then you also talk about the uh, literature. And then you the main, main goal of this course is um, translate them into English. So in this class, you will have a lot of reading and also you will learn a lot of advanced vocabulary and so on, but you wouldn't have much chance to speak or write Korean here. But so if you're more into speaking, uh, pra practicing speaking and also writing, then 415 is a great option. So again, this course is not sequenced. You can take whichever course that fits your schedule first. You can take 415B first. And what they do in class is they read and write, watch some authentic materials. And uh, you discuss them with your peers and also you write a paper on the topic. So if you want to hone your skills in on learning some advanced vocabulary and then practicing writing and then um, speaking in a more advanced level, this is a great option. And 420 in this class, they um, read this manuscript from um, manuscript in 50, that in comes that comes in different editions starting from 15th to 18th century. So you read the same material, but they're produced in different times. So you can learn the history of how certain things um, evolved in changed over the time. Um, this course, the professor told me that anyone can take it without having any any uh, background in Korean because little Korean is foreign to even native speakers like me. Yes, I saw the manuscript. I just 
recommended people in the open resume, I think. So he says, if this is like foreign language to anyone, so you don't really need to have Korean proficiency in this course. Although I think in previous years, usually students who have some background in Korean took the course. But if you're interested in this course, please um, email to the instructor, that, uh, Professor Kim directly. But the other two courses, 410 and 415, you need to have an interview with me unless you took 300 level course at UBC. Amazing. So you're, you're always a wealth of knowledge, Yuri. <laughs> <laughs> you both are, of course. Um, so our next question comes from Diane and to Sophie. How competitive is it to receive your first choice of uni and is there any particular selection process from UBC about who gets to go on exchange? Great question. Um, so I was able to get into, Yonsei was my first choice university and I was able to get into Yonsei. Um, the selection process as stated by UBC Go Global is it is based on your academic standing. Uh, so there is actually an academic grade cutoff. I don't know off the top of my head exactly what that grade is uh, for which if you have, uh, if your GPA is underneath that level, you are actually just uh, barred from going on exchange. And then the universities you are attempting to go into also have an academic cutoff. I think I thought I want to say it was 80%, but I'm not positive on that. I think they're stated on the Google Global website. So the university has um, kind of a academic standing as well. So Go Global has just a base level that you need to reach in order to even apply for Go Global. And then you are applied to all your universities through the Go Global process. And your university uh, selects students based on space, of course, how many seats they have available for UBC students. And you are given priority on that list based on your academic standing. Brilliant. Thank you for that very succinct answer. Um, so our next question comes from Nibras uh, to Yuri. Uh, Nibras is wondering, can I access the Korean language tutoring sessions even if I'm not taking Korean courses at UBC currently? That's our plan for now, yes. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Easy, short and sweet answer. Wonderful. Connie, would you like to bring the next question for us. Beautiful. So Evans would like to know from Sophie, can you expand a little more on the topic exam, the process of taking it and the benefits of taking it? That's a great question. So I took the topic exam in July uh, and I took it in Korea, uh, which was, was quite the experience. I'm not sure how fast the exam fills up overseas. But in Korea, within the first five minutes, all of the seats are taken. And I just struggled so hard to register for this exam. It's a bit complicated. You can't use Apple products to register for the exam. You have to use like a Microsoft software uh, because you have to download this special seat software. So I would certainly recommend, if you're thinking of taking the topic exam, to prepare, find some sort of Microsoft device. Maybe you have one already. I'm so jealous of you if you do, what, how wonderful that must be. Um, to get the software downloaded, make your account, and to register for the exam the second seats open up. Now, that, that's for Korea. The process of registering overseas, uh, I think you apply through the local consulate, like the Vancouver consulate, or for me, it would be the Seattle consulate here if I was to take the exam while I'm here. Uh, so it's a little bit less of a complicated process. But if you are in exchange and looking to take that exam while you're overseas, it is, um, it is a bit of a race to get seats. Uh, I would say in order to work in Korea, you need this topic uh, level. I think you need a level three at minimum to be employed in South Korea. So while I was in Korea, I actually interviewed for a job, but I hadn't taken the topic test. So uh, I wasn't able to actually be given the position partially due to the fact that I didn't have that kind of language level. Uh, also, if you're looking to apply for specific visas, not a student visa. So if you're looking on going exchange, on exchange to Korea, you don't need to take the topic exam in order to get a visa, but some working visas, uh, sometimes I think perhaps the internship visa as well, you require the topic, a certain level of topic exam in order to get that visa and to be employed. There are two topic tests. There's topic one and topic two. Topic one is just a basic uh, Korean language exam on kind of beginner Korean. And so in order to get that, uh, that level that you need in order to be employed, you can't use the topic one exam at all. You need topic two. The structure of the topic two exam is it's six levels, uh, but it's like, yeah, it's a little bit complicated. Level six is 
proficient and fluent. Level five is business Korean, four is advanced, three is intermediate, and anything under three is just an automatic fail. Um, and the exam is very difficult, so uh, I haven't gotten my score back yet. I was aiming for a four, but I'm hoping for a three at least. Um, I think it's a great way, some people take it uh, as just a gauge of their language. Perhaps if you're teaching Korean to yourself and you just want to see what level you're at, it might be fun to challenge yourself and take the exam. Uh, let's see, let me, what else was the question? And the process for taking the exam is, it is in three parts. There is a listening section, a writing section, and a reading section. Um, listening and writing are kind of in the same time block, and then you take a break, and then you do uh, reading. The exam that you're taking, the entire exam is for everybody. So whether you're going to get a topic level six or you're going to fail the topic two exam, uh, you will see the same test as everybody in that room, although they, of course, separate it based on the seats you're in, but the material is all the same. So in order to get a four on the exam, you only have to score about 50% of the questions correctly. So the exam, as you can imagine, it is quite difficult. I did find when I was studying for it, learning a lot of Hanja-based uh, vocabulary is really important so you can recognize that Hanja. So maybe I don't know that word specifically, but I recognize half of the characters. Okay, then I think I know exactly what it's about. Um, yeah, let's see. When is it they offered a couple times a year, several times a year? And I would just recommend taking it if you're looking to work in Korea, uh, or I guess if you want it on your resume as to just kind of some background around how fluent you are in the language. But I would certainly recommend taking it if you are kind of in that advanced, um, upper intermediate advanced category. That's wonderful. Thank you for that, Sophie. So our next question comes from Jaslina who would like to know from Yuri, the, the Korean 102 and 200 classes are quite small right now um, compared to the demand, especially for Korean 102. Can you tell us, are they planning to increase the class sizes at any time soon? I guess looking particularly at um, the upcoming term? Unfortunately, I don't think, I don't know any plan. I don't know if they're planning any. It's not my decision and I haven't That's heard okay. of anything. Sorry. And also I can add a little more about the TOEFL exam. So um, yes, uh, uh, Sophie's right. If you want to register for the exam, you do it through the Vancouver Consulate, uh, Consulate, Korean Consulate in Vancouver, and they have usually twice per year. So once in April and the other in August, I believe. And in order for you to take the April exam, which is usually overlapping our final exam, unfortunately, so a lot of students ended up not being able to take it because of that. But anyways, if you want to take it in April exam, you have to register by early February. So they registration opens in January and it's very low tech. You can either write it, you, you fill it out and then you send it to them by email or you bring it to the consulate, the physical copy. So there's no worry about the Microsoft um, MS product versus not. So it's very low tech, it's easy, but um, you have to know when it's going to be, that they're going to accept the application. And that's usually end of January until early February. So if you're interested, please let me know, email me, and then I can ask the consulate and give you the, the information. For August exam, I think you have to um, apply by May. So you have to know when it's going to happen and you have to plan a little ahead. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Yuri. So, and thank you, Connie, as well for, for manning the questions. As you can see, we're, we're do, doing our best to, to answer them in the order that they're being asked. So the next one comes from Rachel. Just a general question wondering, are there any other tips or suggestions for beginners that you found helped you successfully learn the language when you started with grammar and reading? So probably Sophie might be more equipped to talk about that one. I'm trying to think back to when I started learning Korean and the things that helped me. Um, I think having it be an alphabet is, is great because um, right away, pretty quickly, you're going to be able to learn how to read everything. And there's that really fun period of time where you're just able to read everything around you, even though you have no idea what it means. Um, I, I do think there's so many amazing internet resources. I use Talk to Me in Korean a lot. Um, and I have I just went to their website recently, and they have so many new programs that are amazing, regardless of your level. If you're a beginner, I was looking at their News Korean course that you can take. Um, so there's definitely a, just amazing online resources. There's also, I, I do think that, you know, if 
dramas aren't your thing, if you like dramas, watching dramas and using the subtitles are really helpful. But if dramas aren't your thing, even just news or finding Korean YouTubers that you really like, just kind of being constantly surrounded by that language and listening to it, and also being able to kind of pick up words even in an area that you're really interested in um, is helpful. So if you have a specific interest or hobby, learning the vocabulary in that area can be just kind of a fun, motivating way. Yeah. Dr. Shin, I'm sure you have some really great suggestions as well. Yeah, yeah, I think you'll be able to answer better, especially since you skipped 102 and then start from 200, right? Exactly, right? So I think you can give a better tip than me for that. Right. I did, yeah, I did skip the 102 level for some current UBC students who are curious about which level to do. I took an intensive course at the University of Washington that was kind of an introductory course, but mostly where a lot of my language foundation came from was teaching myself or working with Korean instructors outside of the classroom um, and using a certain textbook resources uh, really helped. So I had kind of a disjointed foundation. It wasn't necessarily one specific 100 based level of understanding, but just by surroundings and, and looking at media and using online resources, you can you can easily kind of get the foundations pretty strong, pretty well. Amazing. Thank you very much. So our next question comes from Peter, question for Yuri wondering if it's helpful to start with consonants and vowels or to go straight into learning the characters and phrases? I think it really depends on your learning style. Even teaching, some teachers start with uh, um, consonant vowels, Korean alphabet. Some start, some teachers actually start with phrases, characters. In case of me, I start with phrases and then learn which char the characters you can transcribe in Korean alphabet. That's my way. But it really depends on your learning style. Some students have to learn the, all the Korean alphabet basic and they have to know that kind of build it on top of that. But some people prefer actually learning by sound of it, how you say things and then later how to write it using Korean alphabet. So it really depends on your learning style. So there's no really one right answer to do this. I get it. That's, that makes sense. So, Sophie, did you have anything particularly that you found useful one over the other? When I started learning, I learned by uh, starting with the alphabet. So I learned consonant and vowels first and used like fun like baby apps on my Korean uh, on my phone that were meant for like Korean children just to get used to the consonants and vowels so I could read anything that was in front of me. Um, but I do have friends who would learn like phrases first, uh, like they would listen to Korean music and they're like, oh, I really like this saying. What does it mean? So there's lots of ways. Any way that works best for you is going to be the one that's going to be the most productive. That will make sense. And just to let everybody know as well, we will, uh, we we're we recording everything today and what we'll do is go back over and listen to all the questions and answers. So next week when you receive a copy of the slides, we'll also send a document with all the questions and answers that have been asked today. So if you have asked something and not been able to jot it down, don't worry, we'll do our best to summarise it all for you. Um, we know that's really useful to have to refer to later on. So we've also got a couple of questions now from our RSVP form. We had some great questions submitted when people signed up. So someone had asked as an English speaker, what are some tips on helping me pronounce the differences between normal, double and strong consonants? I guess Yuri, could you help us with that one? Um, it's hard all the time. I think it's really <laughs> difficult. <laughs> Whether you're learning it and whether you're making that sound correctly takes time. So, Sophie, what was your tips? I still struggle uh, <laughs> with getting those enunciated correctly, specifically like sata and sata, like to buy or to be cheap or to stack, these kinds of things. Man, they just really, every time I, I speak, Korean people in Korea were always like, what? Like, what are you trying to say? And I just felt so embarrassed. It was so difficult. It's it's really hard. I had an instructor once who would hold like a napkin in front of my mouth. So when I would enunciate, he would show me the like how much the napkin would move. And the thought was that with the double consonants, it shouldn't move as much as with like a regular consonant. But I still struggle all the time. It's hard. It's very difficult as a native English speaker to kind of get those enunciations. Yes, completely. I, I often think, uh, particularly for learning the English language as well, for, for those who aren't a native English speaker, we have a lot of funny English rules that don't really make any sense. So 
I certainly take my hat off to everybody who, who learns another language in general. And um, Caitlin's question seems to, to build on that a little bit to say it's hard to not overthink whether or not you're botching the pronunciation of certain words. How do you get over the insecurity and shyness of speaking Korean? And I think, Sophie, you kind of touched on that to say it, it's almost like you just have to do it anyway. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You just kind of have to power through it just in a way. Caitlin, I, I feel you. I have a really thin skin. So if somebody corrects my pronunciation or tells me my grammar is wrong, I take it really personally and I feel really sad and dejected and how can I make this mistake? And it's something I've definitely struggled with um, in my learning career, but for me it's been, it's not just in Korean, it's of course in any kind of academic setting or work setting, uh, is to just know that when you make a mistake and someone corrects you, it's because they want you to speak it perfectly. They want to help you. It's not that they're frustrated with you or think that you are saying it so incorrect. They just want to teach you as you would. You know, if someone spoke to me and said something maybe that wasn't totally correct in English, I might gently correct them back onto the right path just because I want that person to succeed in speaking English. I want them to speak it as perfectly as possible. Um, and so I think it's a lot about just trying trying and trying and trying and trying and, and this is a, a common trope in the world that you know when you fall down get back up and, and keep trying and there's a lot of times where it's really difficult and really embarrassing um but you learn from those things and i think back to like the first time i ever pronounced the word like ice cream in korean and i just tried so hard to make it sound like it was in korean and i had asked somebody at a grocery store and he just like looked at me like do you want some ice cream and i felt so embarrassed because i worked so hard to enunciate it like ice cream and the guy was like just i know exactly what you're trying to say um, and so just try you you're gonna do you're gonna do great you're gonna make mistakes but people want to push you on the right path they just want you to succeed yeah that's it we all have to have to help each other out in this world this crazy new modern world um, okay so our next question comes from Renee Renee is wondering for Yuri how difficult is Korean 415 going to be for students with topic level 5 Oh, actually, if you have TOEFL level five, you might be overqualified for the course. So if you already have TOEFL level five, I think you might not be able to take the course, but please contact me and then I can forward your information to the instructor. Brilliant. And so we will, uh, we do have the contact details available for both Yuri and Sophie um, at the end of the session as well. So we have another question from our RSVP form. And they're wondering how, well, I guess, Yuri, if you could give us a little bit of an idea, how will the Korean classes look like online um, in the current pandemic situation? And what might be the best way to study without being able to face to face communicate with the professor? So the course is taught online, but you will have to attend the speaking session. So for the lower level course, we probably you probably have to attend the class live and then for speaking, practice speaking. For the upper level course, maybe there might be some asynchronous portion and synchronous portion, but you will definitely have a lot of live session that you have to meet with me and other peers and speak. Um, synchronously. So it, it's still a little bit frustrating because it's not as easy and quick as we do in face to face. So for example, if you're doing a small group work, while I'm walking around, I can overhear everybody's conversation from other small groups. But in this online um, setting, once you go into break breakout room, I can really hear each individual groups unless I join that specific room. So it's a little bit um, frustrating and also it takes a little longer than usual face-to-face -face, um, class but I think you will still get a lot of practice speaking practice from the simple session that you probably have to uh, attend mandatory. And to add to what Dr. Shin was saying, um, when I was at Yonsei I took the first, I took the three, the level three intermediate course in person. Um, and then due to coronavirus my second semester moved online for my level four class was online. Um, and I found that it wasn't, I was first really disappointed. I thought that it was going to be really awful, but I was actually really impressed with the ability to teach uh, Korean online and be able to learn with my peers. I thought it was going to feel like a real significant difference as compared to online courses. But in reality, um, 
if you're making the concentration and the effort outside of the classroom to kind of keep up on materials, like uh, homework and writing assignments and things like that, I think you can still get a really great deal out of your Korean classes, even though they're online. So don't be discouraged. Um, they, they, languages seem to translate a little bit more seamlessly online than I had anticipated, certainly. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, we're just going back to a, a couple more questions from our RSVP form and if anyone has any other any other burning questions they want to ask uh, while Sophie and Yuri's voices can before they give out um, please feel free to so uh, another question from the form is what is the typical class size um, of the language classes Yuri can you tell us more about that all the courses are the, the top, a class cap is 24. Sometimes you overfill. Sometimes there are less students, but all the class size the size class size is 24. 24. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's a good a good size. Um, we also I've noticed a couple of people on the form had asked about volunteer opportunities. Um, I believe we have we have some participants who are actually based in Korea right now so obviously that's a little trickier for us to speak about um, but would either of you have any tips um, I guess either there or here uh, with the local Korean communities that might welcome student volunteers in any way? Oh that's very nice because my all my trainings then I really need Korean volunteers to speak Korean whether fully or let up fully but I'm very very glad that there are any volunteers so, so if you are willing to it's not really working I don't feel you just come to the um this kind of session and then you meet with other another student and just chat in Korean so that's really nice so if you have any time to donate if you, if you can work a volunteer please email me and then I can connect you with other students through our online tutoring center. Okay wonderful now we oh just Lena's wondering if you need to be fluent in Korean. No, you don't need to at all, not at all. So I will accept volunteers starting, um, anyone who finished one or two level here, starting from second year Korean students, they can still offer a lot of help to students who were just started to learn uh, Korean anyway. So anyone who can speak Korean, even if you're not fluently, totally, we are very welcome. Wonderful. Okay, so we can get towards our, our last few questions now. Um, we had another question that was, what was the most challenging barrier that you may have met during the process of learning the Korean language? Um, would you have, have one most particular challenging aspect, Sophie, that you could share with us? I would say when you start learning Korean, um, it's really, once you learn the alphabet, that kind of alphabet learning and, and basic like 100 level Korean, I think can be really rewarding because you just grow so incredibly fast. And you get to this point, um, I would say like in the 200-ish level, where you are just learning really well and you're learning really strongly and you feel really confident in the language skills, but it's hard to use what you've learned um, kind of directly. And something I saw actually in Yonsei was a lot of disappointment in the placement test. Um, if they had taken Korean before, they tended to get placed at a lower level. I, I was hoping to be placed in Korean 400 when I first came to Yonsei, but I was put in the, the level three program first. And of course, I'm, I'm in retrospect, I'm really grateful for that because I was able to kind of really strengthen my foundation which was kind of weak but I think when you start learning um, there's like this period where the learning just accelerates and it's really fun and then you hit this really hard plateau and in my experience that plateau comes before you're really conversationally fluent in Korean and so it can feel like you're up against a wall because the the foundation you have isn't necessarily so strong to have total conversations in Korean or to be able to talk about much outside of what you're studying or your personal life it's hard to talk about things outside of that sphere in Korean um, and that was definitely a barrier I faced you know learning really well and then just getting stuck kind of like just just below that like step of fluency or comfortability speaking with Korean speakers out in public just regularly um, and the, the way to overcome that is I just kept telling myself honestly like I had said earlier you're never gonna regret speaking Korean just keep pushing 
Um, and so um, I just kept telling myself, just keep taking the next class, just take the next exam, just keep working towards it. Um, and it, it, it's hard and it's really unmotivating at times, but you'll never regret this. You know, maybe you might not do so well on that vocabulary test, but you learn three new words that you're going to use someday. So to keep pushing yourself. And finally, once you get over that barrier, it feels very rewarding. Uh, while I was in Korea, I think I finally crested that barrier and got to the point where I felt very conversationally fluent, where I could really, I figured in my life that I could pretty much do anything I wanted to do in Korean if I had to. And it was a just a really rewarding moment. So keep pushing yourself. Once you hit that, that level above the plateau, it's, it's a great feeling. I can imagine that would be would be a very cool feeling. Lovely. So uh, we've got our next question it has come from Isabella to so Yuri. How can they most easily access the Korean Language Tutoring Centre? I'm I'm still uh, making the site, um, so I haven't published the page yet. But once it's published, I'm thinking of um, maybe late August, and you can find it on our Korean language. Um, page on our department website, so I'll post it here, or you can email me, I'll give you the, um, the link to that Canvas course directly. Perfect. Yes, asia.ubc.ca is the best short rule of, uh, URL to remember, and then as Yuri said, we'll make sure that everything gets posted there. So perhaps we'll have our last questions now. There was a couple for Sophie, so perhaps we'll, we'll put them together. Um, so Christine is wondering if you had much work or volunteer opportunities over in Korean and whether mm -hmm. you can speak to any other others that might be there at the moment. And then um, also how long it maybe took to start properly conversing in Korean. Um, and then the third part, do you hope to maybe live there, move there again one day? So a bit of a good variety for you. Awesome. What fun questions to answer. Um, in terms of working or volunteering in Korea, a lot of my peers ended up volunteering. Um, if you search in English uh, or through Facebook, there's a lot of volunteering groups with churches or with um, I, with the health pandemic. I'm not so sure about like nursing home uh, or kind of those kinds of volunteering opportunities. Certainly they're limited right now. But to talk about work, I didn't get the chance to work in Korea, though I did um, apply for a position. And my recommendation for you, if you're in Korea, is to look at Aiba Jeongguk. Aiba as in Arabaitu or part-time job, and Jeongguk as in heaven. So Aiba Jeongguk.com or maybe .kr, I can't remember, um, is a really great resource where a lot of part-time jobs are posted. Like I said earlier, you do need to have the topic test to be employed. And if you're on a student visa, you can use it. Um, you can use your student visa to work. It is a little bit of a complicated process to work in Korea. I really wish I had kind of been on the ball a little bit earlier and gotten a job or even an internship. Um, but I would definitely take a look at looking at Aiba Chungbu for kind of positions that are available. Um, it's a really great way. Also, I, you know, I found the most successful thing for me was just going into stores and asking the people like, hey, you, you know, do you, do you need a part-time uh, worker by chance? You know, I speak English and I am learning Korean right now. You know, if you look in areas like Itaewon or Myeongdong, they are really interested in having um, people who are fluent in English and who are, you know, semi-fluent in Korean as well to work. Um, and then volunteering experience would just be, I would look through uh, Facebook or also if you're at a university, uh, usually around the student dorms, they post volunteering opportunities. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to do either of those while I was there, but I would definitely say that if you can take advantage of that while you're abroad, it's a great way to learn the language and meet some friends. Um, for how long did it take me to actually start conversing in Korean? I feel like um, during my time in Korean 200, I finally felt uh, comfortable to like make sentences but I wasn't really able to talk past, like I like I had some really great sentences that I could say, but if I wanted to, if somebody kind of veered off the path of what I had prepared, I was a little bit lost. So I would say kind of in Korean 301 and 302, and especially my time in Korea um, was when conversation just became really natural. When in Korean 301 and 302 at UBC, um, I felt confident um, like rehearsing and then saying things and then kind of in the last half of my time in Korea was when I was able to just open my mouth and just speak and what came out made sense and I was able to have conversations without having to really think too much and that was about when I was at UBC level 400 but 300 really uh, I think is the time when you really get to be conversationally fluent and then last but not least uh, do I hope to move to Korea someday that's a great question 
Korea was really busy. I liked Korea while I was there, but I had a hard time adjusting to the really busy lifestyle. Also, as a foreigner, working and living in Korea is certainly complicated. Uh, in the last half of my time, though, I really fell in love with the country. It took, <laughs> took me a little bit of time to get used to the Korean lifestyle and to, to really find myself enjoying it. But once I made some Korean friends and just started to kind of live my life in Korea, I saw ways in which I could potentially live there in the future. So certainly when I graduate from UBC, I'll be applying for jobs uh, in Canada, the US, and Korea, and we'll see where it takes me. I don't have necessarily a requirement in my life to live in Korea uh, ever again, but if the opportunity is presented to me, I would, I would be very grateful to take it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for all of that, Sophie. So I think that's we've had an amazing variety of questions come from everybody today. So we will give our two panelists a little bit of a break just while I bear with me while I scroll back to the end. So what we wanted to finish with was just to say to everybody that uh, thank you again for joining us today. If you would like to contact either Yuri or Sophie with more questions, you can do so via their email addresses on the screen there. So Yuri is probably probably the, the slightly better contact if it's regarding upcoming course um, information. Obviously, Sophie can speak a lot about her um, her experience more and, and other tips, but just bear in mind as well that they're both also working full time too, so give them a little bit of time to get back to you. And we do also have a feedback survey that we've put together. If you wouldn't mind, you can find it in the chat run uh, the chat group at the side there with the link to Qualtrics. We'd love to know how you found today. Any feedback for us is great. Of course, you can also feel free to give us suggestions for future webinars or ideas. This Korean webinar actually came out of a suggestion from our last webinar. So we always like to hear what the students would like to learn. So thank you for all the nice feedback and comments putting up. I apologise as well, I don't think the chat function was actually enabled when we started. So thank you to the kind person who let me know that. I apologise if anyone was trying to type in a question and wasn't able to. So, so glad that I was able to get that sorted. And thank you everybody again. We've actually, we've finished a little bit earlier on time, but I think we've sort of covered all of the main information. So any last thoughts, anything anyone wants to post otherwise? Thank you again and stay safe and all the other things. Yeah. Thank you everybody and good luck learning Korean. You're all gonna do an amazing job. Whether or not it's hard, you're gonna you're gonna succeed. Absolutely. Amazing. Wonderful. Well as our as our panelists take a drink of water and you can <laughs> start you yes, you can feel free to, to finish. I won't officially close the session on people yet, but Excellent. Well, yeah, thank you again so much again. Um, I was, was also, I was wondering, Sophie, I was going to get you to talk about the food again, just because I love what you wrote in your <laughs> written document about like the food court and all the great food you got to try. Uh, that must so have been amazing. amazing. I'm missing it so much now. I mean, the food here is quite good. I, I, I did miss some American foods and being able to cook. <laughs> but Man, when I would give to just like go back into Shincheon and just get some takai meat or something like really quick and delicious. Ah, oh, but it's okay. It's not something in the future. <laughs> oh, what's the best uh, Korean food place that you, in Vancouver? Or, oh, in or Vancouver. Vancouver. You know, it's funny. I haven't eaten a lot of Korean food in Vancouver, but there's a there's a restaurant called Hongdae Pocha, which is so funny because if anyone's been to Korea, Hongdae is a neighborhood and Pocha is like a cafe or like a like a kind of like a kind of like a restaurant, I guess. And it was so funny because I had eaten there so many times in Vancouver, really good food. They have a really delicious chicken dish. Um, and then I went to Korea and I was like, oh my gosh, Hongdae, like I'm in Hongdae. Hongdae Pocha, like it makes so much sense. Uh, and so Hongdae Pocha would just be like restaurants in the Hongdae neighborhood. And that restaurant in Vancouver is exactly what I remember it to be like in, in uh, Hongdae. So Hongdae Pocha in Robson, kind of on Robson Street, would definitely recommend for some super yummy food. And they also offer a 50% off student discount, which is pretty amazing. Five zero. As a college student, I cannot complain. Korean food for 50% off. What a, what a deal. That's incredible. Yeah. And I think Rachel in the comments, it looks like Rachel's agreeing with us. That's good. No. <laughs> Connie's also been to, been to Lauheed. Lauheed. Amazing. Certainly. Recommendations, any good Korean restaurants in Vancouver? 
Oh, wow. Sura, Jejudo. Jejudo. Oh, my God. Sura. Sura. Oh, okay. Ooh, food recommendations for dietary restrictions. Oh, good question. That could I found be trickier. <laughs> I don't know about in Vancouver, but in Korea, that was I. If you have a dietary restriction, it's super difficult to to eat around that. It's not impossible for for sure, but things like if you're vegetarian or garlic and onions, man, Ray, Korean food is that's super hard <laughs> to avoid garlic and onions in Korean yeah. food. Oh man. Maybe if you can ask the chef, you can practice your Korean and you could ask for no garlic or no onions when they cook. It's a great That's a good point. practice. How how would you how would you say that in Korean if you said may I have no garlic or onion in my food? I would just if it was me, I would probably say like I have an allergy. I can't even say allergy in Korean. Allergy. Allergy. Allergy guys all. Or you can also say allergy. Allergy, allergy, or you can say garlic, onion. No, you can't say that. You know, you can't say that. You don't want to talk, mother. Don't worry. Right. Ah, that's cool. That's really cool. I've got a few more suggestions coming in. That's great. Port Moody, Sam Sweeney. We can we can add these to the end of our document when we go. <laughs> Why not? But so yes, I mean even Korean barbecue obviously has become quite popular um, right. everywhere, and I can understand why. But I I can say like in in Australia, uh, Koreans become much more popular. Um, whereas ten twenty years ago, I don't think many people would have even known Korean cuisine. Like if you right. said you know even we're talking about getting a bowl of bibimbap or anything like that, people would have thought that was really weird. Um, so it's it's very high on my list of places to go when we can <laughs> again safely. That's for sure. And also, if you're strict vegan, it's very difficult. Even kimchi has some um, some sometimes fish in it. So and also some vegetarian noodle. You might be able to see it at all. But soup stock is made of anchovies. So if you're strict vegan, then it's really really tough to get anything that works for you. I was. I was actually vegan uh, in Vancouver uh, prior to coming to Korea, but I made an exception that this last year I was going to put <laughs> animal products back into my diet just for ease because it was, it, you know, I thought it would, might take away from my experience a little bit um, in Korea yeah. if I was really restricted to just eating just some vegan food that you could find if it's possible. <laughs> True. Yes, I could see. I, I think the food aspect of, of traveling everywhere is is a very popular one, Always and understandably, awesome. that helps you to get get a lot more understanding of a, a culture for sure. <laughs> so, oh, look at this damsel on Denman Street. Oh, lovely. This is all making me hungry as well. I'm glad that all these places have have still come out. Oh, okay. I mean, we're. I'm happy to keep it open till 4:30. Um, if, if others are still here, if that's okay with you guys, I guess, and then I'll, I will I close, close us down. But uh, we do have a last question from Jonathan for Yuri. Do you know how it is to work from an international company with an office in Korea? If if Yuri is able to comment on that, I'm not sure <laughs> of your expertise. Um, I do not know about Microsoft or Google, but I know that there are some uh, some people who work in Samsung and you don't really expect great work-life balance there. <laughs> oh, work, 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 work. So I don't think it's really great. One of my um, my parents, my family friends, he used to work for Samsung in he has a PhD from some American, uh, some American universities, and he was working for Samsung, and he quit, and he went back to U.S. and he got a government job. So he gets now paid only one third of what he used to get from Samsung, but he's very happy because now he can breathe and he can enjoy his weekend. But when he was working there, especially Samsung is notorious for making you work more. They pay you well, but you definitely have to pay for what you're getting paid. So I I heard that it's pretty tough too. To work there, you have to be really always busy. And so, we just mentioned about the busy lifestyle. So, right. I think it's going to go maximum if you work for some some kind of company. I'm not sure about MS or Google. Though. Sorry. No, but Jonathan, you might want to keep an eye on our uh, website and events as well. We are actually in the process of looking at doing another webinar towards the end of August. We have a an alumni at UBC who is 
in touch with a lot of different other people in the network and we're looking at doing one with a bunch of journalists uh, based in different Asian areas. I don't think anyone is specifically in Korea, but I think they'll all be able to speak to living and working in crazily busy yeah. Asian cities. So we're we're in the cool. in the process of getting that one. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're just in the process of hopefully getting that one all sorted, but we'll put all the details on our website about that. And when it's uh, confirmed, it's looking like it'll be the 27th of August. So um, I think work, yeah, yep, work-life balance. I think, that, is, Jonathan, I think yeah. the, the, work, the work week hours, 52 hours a week, that's like a new legal law that just changed too in Korea. So I know if you're used to working in North America, your, your work hours are like 40 hours a week, but 52 is kind of, that's, that's not overtime included, which is crazy. It's a lot of working. <laughs> My goodness, went to, came home from work at 12 a.m. and went to work at 5. What, they, God, when did they sleep, Sylvie? They slept for five hours, three hours, plus a bit of dinner. <laughs> That's crazy. Ray, okay, I see your question about live music in Korea. That's such a good question. I also am really into jazz, and I love jazz music. And the jazz scene in Korea is um, actually – it's pretty good. Um, I would say if you're interested in like international musicians, there's not a lot of jazz artists that come uh, from overseas to Korea. There's actually an international jazz festival in Korea, but it's mostly just local players. Um, if you Google UBC, uh, not, not UBC, Korea or Seoul jazz clubs, there's a whole list of some really good ones. Like Boogie Woogie Seoul is really good. Casa Corona Seoul is also really good. Um, and they do a lot of live concerts. And honestly, pre-corona pre times, South Korea is kind of opening back up quite a bit, so they still have live music a couple times uh, a week. And usually these kind of live music cafes are also in Hapjong. If you look in the Hapjong neighborhood, there's a lot of live music cafes, like Bittersweet Sound, um, where you can go and like one night they have three or four or five or six uh, live performers in a night. So the jazz scene is pretty good in, in Korea as well. Amazing. Is it possible to work as a plastic surgeon in Korea as a foreigner? Goodness. I think I don't they, um, how can I say? I don't know which country, but certain, um, cert, uh, so the doctors, how do you call it, certificate? Um, from certain countries, I think they are still accepted. But you might have to do that exam again to be mm. able to work there. But this is a little bit out of my knowledge so I can't really talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And they have so many plastic good plastic surgeons. So anyways. So um in Southern University Korean language program. I know someone who teaches there. Their program is pretty solid. It's one of the um the oldest programs in Korea as well, I think. I don't know um students who took the courses there, but I know the teacher who used to teach there who was here as a visiting teacher for one year, and it seems they are um, they are well balanced between grammar and speaking. Certain language programs I heard that they are more focusing on speaking versus some are more focusing on um, grammar. But I heard that they are. Pre it seems like from the teacher side, it seems they are very pretty well balanced. I think the program is pretty solid, but I do not I know a, how students feel. Yeah, one of my exchange friends, uh, she took. Uh, the Korean language intensive at Sogang and then took Yonsei's intensive and she said that exactly what you were saying Dr. Shin uh, that Sogang is really well balanced but they really focus a lot on speaking and she really 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 appreciated that um, she said that she's taken a couple of universities programs and, and Sogang was among her favorites in in what she learned she thought that what she learned was very applicable right away I heard that also Songkyung one is really uh, focusing a lot on speaking right yeah that's from a student who took the course there. 